Lamela from South Africa. Ah. Uh, you, you've made an emphasis on, the, on peace in your speech throughout. As a, what I called a cornerstone of public diplomacy. I want your, your, your response. Assessing the international politics, trade, how it relates to it. Can this peace be achievable without justice? Well, yes, it is a very good question, but you know, it is even more complicated now because now we are aiming even to achieve peace between ourselves. You know, the problem is starting to be more rooted and deeper uh, in our soul, not just between people. But um, unfortunately, the situation, I would talk about my country, and I think you had also the same experience in South Africa many years ago. But I think you succeed in your country to establish, uh, I would say, or to uh, seed the right, uh, or to plant the right seeds for peace in your soul and in your community, uh, rather than to plant hatred and uh, animosity and uh, between your peoples. But uh, unfortunately, what we are facing now, let us say in Egypt, for instance, we are uh, a country where we are looking for peace, internal peace, not just even you know peace with the others, but we are looking for peace between ourselves. And every family in Egypt now is uh, deeply divided, divided, you know, to different, uh, I would say, um, directions and uh, be beliefs. And so the problem is uh, so uh, hard now in, uh, in order to try to say that peace is um, a real notion which we are looking for. So um, I think uh, our... Uh, mission is now so complicated because you know we have to address ourselves first and we have to deal with ourselves and to deal with the uh, you know the same society the same people in the same country in order to achieve a real peace and then maybe we can look after uh, beyond the bo our borders but uh, justice as you said this is one of the main reasons behind you know the revolution in Egypt on the 25th of January that people were seeking for real justice in this country, especially social justice, which is, uh, you know, we suffered a lot from the lack of this social justice. And till now, we didn't find a way. Until now, we didn't find the right, you know, uh, plan in order to achieve this social justice. So I guess we will be involved in this kind of internal disputes and internal, I would say, hatred for a long time till we will have uh, the right way to, uh, which will give us the idea or, the, or let us say the, the notion that we, yes, we have now a real peace in our society and then after that we can deal with the others and we can talk about you know, a global peace. So I'm so sorry to tell you that we are in a very critical time now in Egypt and we are facing um, the same problems which you faced in your country, but I am very proud to say that you already uh, overcome these problems in a very civilized way. Salam uh, Zaharan from Lebanon. Uh, I want to ask you, Excellency, about the Arab League strategy in the conflict resolution in the Arabic world conflicts, especially after the Arab Spring, we are the youth of seeing falls, the Arab fall after that. So what's the strategy for the Arab League? Thank you. I'm sorry to say that, or let us say I'm afraid to say that there is no clear strategy for the Arab League in the conflict resolutions uh, in the Arab world. Um, and we have a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, problems. The one like in Syria, in Libya, I think the Arab League was always behind, you know, the international efforts. They never tried to initiate, uh, I would say, a real strategy and uh, to be followed. The Arab League is so weak. And why it is, uh, it is weak? Because, you know, we are the countries where we are 
I would say, not giving them the uh, good mandate in order to be more stronger. So the Arab League, I, I can say that um, uh, is not capable even to solve uh, any of the problems which we are facing now. And it's not even the, the directed, you know, the, the real efforts of this league for the social development and the economic development. We are just talking about politics and talking about the differences between leaders. Uh, in the Arab League, but we never had a real plan in order to foster the social uh, development or the economic development in, in, in our part, in our region. So uh, we need a, another revolution, you know, for the Arab League in order to uh, have a lot of uh, different perspective towards the real problems which we are facing now. <laughs> Yeah, we are, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the problem that, the, the, as I said, it is, uh, Arab League is a group of, uh, I would say, willingness from the Arab leaders. And all of them, they are not uh, so keen to have uh, strong bodies, you know, governing the situation in the Arab world. They are just keeping it as a sort of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, forum for debates and that's it. But we never had a serious action to solve any kind of problem. Even for the Syrian problem, we were behind the UN. And uh, the Arab foreign minister, when they always, you know, having these kind of meetings to consult about the progress in Syria and how to combat the situation there and how to, to help the Syrian uh, people, we, uh, we didn't have effective, uh, I would say, decisions in that regard. We were always, you know, behind the UN and even Al-Akhdar al-Ibrahimi, when we choose him, we choose him as uh, a special envoy for the Arab League and the UN. We, we, we don't have even the ability and the uh, courage to have our own envoy in, uh, to, to solve our problems. So I am sorry to tell you that the Arab League, I think, after the revolution, as, as you said, in the Arab world, I think the main uh, subject which they should address is the social development and the economic development and education. And let us keep the politics and, you know, this kind of uh, problems which will not be solved uh, because we don't have any kind of uh, firm uh, willingness to uh, solve this kind of problem. So I think the best thing for the Arab League to address certain problems which is now prevailing in the Arab world. Your Excellency, thank you for that wonderful speech. Um, I feel it when you were making your speech yesterday and that of today, but also I... Could you introduce uh, yourself as okay. well? Asif? Could you okay. introduce yourself as well? Could you introduce yourself? Okay. I am Dr. Francis Ngozi Chukukere from Nigeria. Ah, okay. Thank you. I went to Abuja many times. Okay, you'll be there <laughs> soon. I hope you'll visit very soon. It's a lovely place. Yeah. Yes, it is. Mm. Uh, sir, when you speak of um, Egypt, uh, the nation and the, uh, uh, um, the uprisings there, I do not, there doesn't seem to be any hope about Egypt emerging in future as one strong united state, you know, united uh, country. And you were once an ambassador. The Arab League is probably not working now. And those behind the uprisings, well, those that made it happen, were not only the adults, but also the youths. Yeah. Now, with the kind of divisions, with the kind of problems in the Arab world, especially in Egypt, for specifically in Egypt, there doesn't seem to be any headway for a lasting solution. And apparently, um, this is probably the first time you are experiencing this kind of upheaval, this kind of uh, crisis. Comparing it with South Africa is uh, an anomaly because South Africa had theirs for so many years before they emerged uh, a stronger country. Are you, do you have an NGO? Okay, I, I reckon that 
Well, uh, we're all getting older. What would you like to be remembered for in 30 years from now, 40 years from now? In what way have you been, were you able, are you able to help in engendering peace and stability in Egypt? Besides calling for a new, another revolution rather than election. Thank you, sir. You know, uh, uh, Egypt is uh, facing a very critical, uh, I would say, time now. Uh, yes, we already embarked on the uh, a real revolution. The people and the young people, they uh, went to the streets and they changed the president and they were trying to change the system and they were looking for uh, welfare and prosperity and justice and social justice and many things, you know, for a better life in Egypt. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't uh, use the transitional period, you know, in the right way and to try to achieve these goals which uh, drive the young people to go to the streets and to sacrifice their blood and uh, to try to achieve uh, the idea of having a real freedom in our country. We are facing a lot of trouble. As I said yesterday, we, our economy is start to melt down and this will be a real problem. We lost almost the tourism industry because you know there is a 30 percent uh, I would say reduction in the um, visitors to Egypt and we have uh, many other uh, problems, especially the uh, the people now they are looking for a real justice and uh, they are demands they are asking for their rights to, to live in a good way so the, the and in the meantime we don't have i would say a real consensus inside the the, uh, the the country itself and the people they are divided as you mentioned and as i mentioned yesterday so the young people also lost the, uh, I would say, the hope to have a better life and even opportunity to have uh, jobs and to have a better future. So this, uh, the, the, situ the whole situation is a real mess now in Egypt and we cannot say that we are in the right way to have um, uh, a roadmap to uh, a real progress in our country. We still need uh, maybe some time and we still need also to, as I said, to have peace uh, I mean, between the people inside Egypt, because you know the situation now is completely changed before uh, the revolution. We have uh, a lot of uh, divided, and even you know every uh, uh, group is strictly adheres to their ideas and to their minds, and they never even try to listen to the others or to understand the other. Egypt will remain Egypt and nothing will, I mean, maybe we'll have some problems for a certain period of time, but I think in the near future we will overcome all these problems and we will regain our image and our role, and I am sure of that. But unfortunately, the only problem which we are facing now is the economy, and we, can, we don't have the, the luxury to spend another two years for, uh, for a, a transitional period where we will lo we will lose all our, I would say, reserve, uh, the hard currency reserve, and this would be a real problem for the Egyptian uh, people. So we need a decisive and uh, 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 some actions in order to regain the revive of our uh, economy very soon because with, let us say we can try to encourage the tourism industry to gain the same position like before and also we can uh, choose the uh, you know the uh, the construction field we can uh, I would say uh, try to uh, uh, encourage people, you know, to start to build again in, in Egypt because, you know, and to investors also to come back to the Egyptian uh, market. We have a lot of things to do, but unfortunately, uh, politics is trying to deprive us from this right. And that's why we are so late. And even uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, problems which we are facing now, it will give us a very hard time in the near future to regain our position economically and uh, politically and socially. So the, the, I'm asking for uh, 
a quick solution and a quick uh, uh, remedy to this, uh, you know, uh, illness society which we are facing now. I believe there are no quick fixes to many things. And uh, some countries that have uh, uh, died economically have had opportunities to rise again. And if the national results are dwindling and in the next two years there will be nothing left, there will still be humans left, sir. I suggest you start a peace process. You were once an ambassador. Start a peace process, start an NGO, or anything. But anything about revolution, the shedding of blood, and youths shedding their blood on the streets of Egypt, uh, if you are calling for it, sir, I do not support. The, you, being once an ambassador, you could start up a peace process, an NGO. Even the Arab League, you thought, was not working. You can even walk through there. You, sir, as an individual, could make it put up a lot of changes in Egypt. I strongly believe that because I feel your passion. But perhaps your direction, uh, I do not share it. There should not be any further shedding of blood because it's the blood of youths that are yeah, shed. I, I Adults agree. run away. Only for the youth to shed their blood. Thank you, sir. I, I, agree, I agree with you, and uh, I can tell you that I am already, you know, established a new NGO. I am the head of it. I am the president of a new NGO in Egypt, and we call it uh, for the sake of Egypt. This is the title of this NGO, and we, uh, our main issue is to promote tourism again, uh, and that's why we are traveling uh, to uh, Dubai, to Bahrain, to Kuwait, in order to promote the uh, Arab. Uh, tourists to come back to Egypt and in the meantime we will direct our revenues to upgrade some of the uh, hospitals in Egypt which need uh, um, uh, 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 real help in order to, uh, to upgrade the equipment which uh, is completely destroyed during the revolution. Allow me to ask a follow-up question to Ambassador Arabi. Very often, cultural diplomacy is thought to be something between countries, uh, so between Egypt and Germany, etc. Based on what you also just underlined, even though, of course, economy is priority number one, I wonder what opportunities you would see for cultural diplomacy within Egypt. Uh, and there also, this leads into the conversation we had yesterday, what would ICD can do or what an NGO can do within a country like Egypt? Do you see space uh, or opportunities for cultural diplomacy now within Egypt? Uh, as opposed to just between Egypt and other countries? Yes, there is always a place uh, for cultural diplomacy to be, you know, exercised in, in, in inside Egypt. And uh, I think uh, we did uh, an, uh, two events uh, with a colleague of mine in, the, uh, in social clubs in Egypt, one of Nadi Gizira, uh, the Gizira club and another one, Said club. And we were trying to promote this idea by uh, having a sort of message that uh, art and music, they are so essential to our soul. So that's why we should you know, try to uh, use it in our, you know, as an indirect message to people that uh, music and art could play a very important role in order to give you uh, peace of mind and the peace of soul. So uh, uh, we are trying to do the, uh, um, uh, some events in Egypt, but uh, it is a little bit uh, sluggish. I mean, the progress is a little bit sluggish, not uh, so uh, as as we w as we wish. But uh, I think we can yes play more role in, in that regard, and we can do a lot of events uh, with using the, the notion of public diplomacy and the uh, uh, culture of peace. Uh, but I, I think. Uh, what we need in Egypt is maybe uh, also some other, uh, I would say, different uh, issues like uh, trying to listen to each other and trying to uh, understand each other and trying to, uh, I would say, love each other. I look forward to continuing the brainstorming with you. I've now seen a flurry of hands. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll give, since you're right here, Professor Chakraborty first, then we'll go to the back, ladies first, and then we'll come to the front. If I could ask you all to keep your questions, again, concise uh, to the points, we'll try to get as many people as we can, uh, and also introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Professor Chakraborty. I teach here. What is the national brand you would like to see take over now? 
or the one that you would like to create for Egypt? It's a good question. Yeah. Civilized country uh, earn a lot of uh, deep rooted in the history. Uh, moderate country, civil country, uh, playing important role, you know, to uh, enlighten the the, uh, the region itself or the whole region which we were living for, uh, in, and. Um, this is the image which we you know we uh, we had for the past uh, I would say thousand years. Egypt is Egypt from the pharaonic era till now, and it will not change the image. Uh, we will not change the image of this country. But now we have a lot of problems in uh, in Egypt. And I remember one of the tourists uh, or the tourism campaign were even you know calling for that the Egyptian always smiling. And I I, I guess we already. Uh, lost all, uh, this brand also, the, our smile. So we have to uh, try to reinvigorate, you know, the Egyptian uh, mentality, the Egyptian personality, the Egyptian culture, all, all, of, all these things, you know, it is well known in the region and everybody knows about uh, the uh, Egypt and how we helped, you know, the humankind to have a great civilization and how to, uh, we were even instrumental in all the peace process in our region. So this is Egypt. We cannot be, you know, part of the uh, axis of, uh, of evil. Uh, again, this is, will not happen and we will not tolerate that. And we will not tolerate also a dictatorship or fascism in our country. So this is the Egyptian way of life and it will remain like this and we will combat any kind of change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's go to the back, ladies first, and then uh, we'll come to the front. If you could please introduce yourself and stand as well, that'd be great. Dr. Kathy Baldwin, a postdoctoral research fellow in anthropology, University of Oxford. Um, I just wondered if there's any hope that uh, Egypt or any of the other post-revolution uh, Arab countries might see any possible way forward in contributing something new in terms of building relations with Israel and contributing to the peace process in uh, Palestine and Israel. Well, I can tell you that uh, the last... Uh uh, accidents between the Hamas and uh, Israel. I think Egypt uh, played uh, the uh, traditional role, which is always playing uh, to try to uh, pacify the situation between the two sides, and we already succeed on that. And uh, as I can see, the recent government uh, adheres to the principle of uh, peace with Israel, adheres to the treaty. Uh, between Egypt and Israel, and uh, but I cannot uh, tell you that we will have a warm relationship with Israel under the uh, present uh, government. But at least we will keep the uh, I would say the uh, um, not cold peace, but at least peace. Uh, <laughs> I will not call it cold, but it will, uh, we will we will try to maintain the peaceful relationship with this country. And of course, we will help the Palestinians to protect their rights. And I think we also are we now are playing uh, this mediation between Hamas and uh, Fatah uh, to have uh, a common ground between the two sides in order to face any Israeli threats in the near future. So uh, we will play our traditional role. Uh, I can judge the short term. But I cannot tell you uh, what kind of relationship between Egypt and Israel uh, on the long term uh, under the, uh, the recent regime. Nobody can predict what will be uh, in the future between the two sides. Thank you very much. Let's come to the front of the room if we can. I think he's been waiting long. I think and he's been well. Yeah? Or, um, all right, then we'll, they're right afterwards. Okay, please. Go ahead, please, and please introduce yourself. And again, try to keep the questions as concise as possible because I see a number of more hands. Okay, my, my name is Amir Nabi. I work for the Ministry of Culture of Egypt as a general director of International Festival Department. Firstly, I would like to thank His Excellency Ambassador Al Arabi for uh, what he said. And I think as an Egyptian, he, he tell what uh, most of the Egyptian want to say. Uh, 
but uh, allow me to say my humble opinion to my colleague uh, from Nigeria. In my humble opinion, to put any country in progress, you need only one thing. Only one thing is to raise awareness between the people. Without that, you can't do anything. To raise awareness, you have two ways. First way, to bring children and to give them well educated, to tell them the right thing and the wrong thing. And, and unfortunately, we don't have much time to do that. Second thing, to put all the people in crisis, in problem, to, to, feel, to make them feel that they are in the problem. So they need to listen to each other, to speak to, to, to each other, to find new way. So we are now in the next position. Maybe that lead to good thing, and maybe it will destroy the country, but fortunately, uh, Egypt is a very old country. So I believe that we can find the way to discuss and to uh, accept each other. We need only to raise awareness. So what happened in Egypt now, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. Because if you went there, you will find illiterate, children, elders, all of them speak about the destiny, our own destiny, what we're supposed to do, and that is, uh, was absent in the past. But now, if you went to Egypt, you will, if you go to Egypt, you will love to see each one speak to each other. We have to work together or fight each other. That's rise awareness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's continue uh, with one of our MA students who's patiently waiting there. Okay. <laughs> if you could please introduce yourself as well and keep it concise. Hi. Um, hi. My name is Sarjan. I am one of the master's students here. I'm not going to speak for audience. I'm going to ask my questions to you. Uh, my question is, um, Egypt, uh, as you know, has a unique history and also it has a 1,500 1, years of Islamic history and just been through a revolution, new revolution. And this revolution is supported by the powers, the, the imperial powers, which uh, created the borders, actual borders of Egypt. And it is supported. Isn't it disturbing that you made a revolution that's supported by imperialistic powers of the world? And my question is also, you spoke about the eternal peace. And what, is, what, um, what the government thinks about eternal peace, uh, um, like, what kind of treaty they are going to run with um, Hebrews, Hebrews people, Christian people, and the people who deny to believe in a God and everything, like atheists and everything. My questions are this, so thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, well, I can tell you that the government uh, has no, I would say, uh, uh, attention to this uh, kind of uh, how to solve the internal peace uh, how, or how, how to reach the internal peace between the Egyptians now. I didn't see any efforts at all uh, since, uh, I would say, yeah, from, uh, since the uh, uh, 11th of February 2011, the, which uh, we can consider it as a new era in, in, uh, in Egypt, I didn't see any efforts from anybody in order to achieve or to realize this kind of internal peace. On the contrary, there is uh, some media, uh, you know, apparatus and some uh, journalists and some pol politicians, they are, you know, trying to provoke people and even to deepen the division between the, the Egyptians. And uh, so I didn't see it uh, as a real effort in order to tackle this uh, issue. Um, your, your first part uh, of your question, you know, uh, it is... Uh, too early maybe to uh, judge who, uh, because you know, we, we are in the Middle East always under the oppression of this uh, kind of uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, <laughs> and so it is a little bit early, you know, to judge uh, if we can say that yes, the revolution was, some people supported it or not. But I can tell you exactly that the people went out to the streets, you know, uh, nobody triggered this, uh, I mean, the, uh, the revolution. Uh, even this guy in Tunisia who burned himself, nobody asked him to do that. Uh, people, you know, they suffered from many uh, reasons, and that's why they went out to the streets and trying to topple or to change the regime in uh, the Arab world. So let me tell you that uh, Yes, there is some theories saying that there is, it was a sort of uh, change in the Middle East uh, under the, uh, the um, 
auspices of some certain powers in the, in the West. But uh, I can tell you, we know the theories. And we, it is even, in the, in the, in the, you can check the internet, you can find a lot of uh, uh, discussion about that. Today we were discussing the, uh, the plans of Richard Pearl. Uh, you remember him, he was one of the President Bush, the son. Uh, he was working in the Pentagon at the time, and he was talking about the change in the Middle East, and he was even mentioning, you know, Iraq and uh, Syria and Lebanon and uh, Egypt. And he said, uh, he said that Egypt will be the uh, the the grand the the, the grand prize or the grand prix of uh, these efforts. So at the time we were just you know reading these uh, theories, but without any imagination how it will be implemented. But I can assure you that the Arab Spring, I think it came from the people themselves, nobody triggered or pushing them or even forcing them to go to the streets in order to implement the American theories or the American intentions in the, in the region. Let's continue. One more question. Your okay. Excellency, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I just recently returned from Iran. Oh. From Sorry, where? My name is Darnell Summers. I just returned from Iran. From Iran? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was there last September and also uh, last month. And I was invited there uh, to take part in several conferences. One was the Hollywoodism conference. The other one was a conference um, and a film festival in September. A New Horizon First International Film Festival. I'm a filmmaker myself. I like to ask you, because I did meet people from Egypt in Iran who were also invited uh, to, for you to comment on the relationships between, the relations between Iran and Egypt. And also, uh, there seems to be a misconception about just where Egypt is. I meet so many people who don't realize that Egypt is in Africa. <laughs> and, and another part of that consternation is the fact that the Egyptians themselves, a lot of them don't say that they're Africans. You know, so I'd like you to kind of like give me your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, for Iran, I think we have a new approach towards Iran. We have a new uh, policy uh, towards this country. Iran is a very important uh, player in our region. Uh, maybe they are a little bit aggressive when they are trying to implement uh, their policies in the region. Uh, but Egypt also is an important country and we have our own visions towards the area and especially the Gulf states and the security of the Gulf states. So that's why we are always you know, in contradiction between uh, I mean, uh, the two policies and the two strategies in the region. But now uh, after uh, the, uh, uh, um, the arrival of the political Islam in Egypt, I think uh, uh, we have, uh, I would say, President Morsi went there and uh, President Jad also came to Egypt. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, these two visits were under the, uh, the international uh, gathering, not just a bilateral uh, visiting. But uh, I can tell you that we have a new uh, Policies and a new approach. Uh, the, our Minister of Tourism, he was there in Tehran uh, two days or three days ago, and he already signed a new agreement which will uh, allow them, the Iranians, to come to visit Egypt to a certain places, and they will be granted their visas uh, upon their arrival to the airport. They will have to, each one should have or pay a hundred dollars in order to enter uh, the Egyptian soil. And uh, this will be the new step, uh, you know, for having a new relationship with Iran. I can tell you that uh, uh, we, you, we might face a real progress in our uh, policy uh, towards Iran. And uh, my personal opinion, when I was a minister, uh, I was against this kind of warm approach. I was, uh, you know, advocating the idea of having a gradual approach towards them and using the cultural diplomacy first. Tourism also is a cultural diplomacy, but I think I, I thought it, it might be even better to start uh, you know, gradually and having a strategic dialogue with them to put the red lines you know, in front of them, especially concerning the, the security of the Gulf uh, states. 
Uh, what is the second? I can't recall. Uh, the second part you mentioned? Africa. Africa. Yes, Africa. This is a very important uh, thing. And uh, you are absolutely right. Africa is maybe one of the important circles of our diplomacy. But uh, we failed, actually, in our policies towards African countries. And we have a lot of problems now, uh, especially with the Nile Basin countries. And uh, I hope with the new regime in Egypt that we will pay more attention to the, our relation to African country. I was working with Botrus Ghali for many years when I was a young diplomat. Uh, uh, and I went with him to many uh, African countries. We still have a lot of uh, credibility in Africa. Uh, you can find President Nasser pictures in uh, different uh, places. You can find a lot of construction companies doing, uh, you know, building schools, airports, hotels, uh, uh, many things. And we can, you can also find a lot of uh, Egyptian uh, pro uh, products, you know, in the African markets. We are part of the Comessa. We are, uh, of course, an active member of the uh, African uh, organization. And uh, we are also part of the NIPAD, which is uh, now talking about the good governance and uh, some other th uh, many other things. So uh, we are active in Africa, but I can say that we are always looking north. We, are n <laughs> we never try to, yes, to look uh, south and to enhance the dialogue between the south countries. Is, is there a final question or if... If not, then we actually are out of time, but I want to maybe take this opportunity, Your Excellency, to thank you once again. We really thank appreciate you. you having come, uh, made the journey extra to Berlin uh, just for this conference. And really, I'm also very, very happy that this will serve as a new beginning uh, for us to continue our collaboration. I am yes, sure of that. Such a wonderful partnership when you were serving as ambassador here in Germany. Now I think the potential is even greater uh, since you're based in Cairo. So if we could please all join in extending our very, very sincere gratitude. Thank to you. Ambassador Rami. Thank you.